members for this defense. We start with the manuscript reviewers. We have first Pierre Sans, who is professor des universités at Nixi Sorbonne Université, and Kevin Hugna, who is professor at Université de Lausanne in Switzerland. And uh, for the other examinators and members of the jury, we have Claudia Igna, who is a researcher and HDR at Loria in Ria, Nancy, in France, and Alessandra Toninelli, who is IT director at Rejoined in Italy. The PhD was supervised by Daniel Miognandi, who is chief executive <coughs> officer in U Hooper in Italy, and Guillaume Pierre, professor des universités at Université de Rennes 1 in France. I will be myself the president of this PhD jury. Um, most then, the floor is yours for 45 minutes presentation, and then we'll have a session of question and answers with the different members of the jury. Yes. Let's go. Yes, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for attending my PhD defense session on automated application privacy compliance checking in distributed fog environments. This thesis is supervised by Professor Guillaume Pierre at University of Rennes 1 and INRIA Research Lab in France, and Daniele Mirandi uh, from Uhopper Company in Italy. Online applications are blended with our daily lives. We use these applications to get different services from uh, entertainment to communication. These applications typically use our personal data. Personal data is defined as any information related to an identified or identifiable natural person. Examples are our location, our voice, and video. But most of nowadays applications processing is happening in the cloud. Cloud computing is a technology that provides uh, processing, storage, and networking, uh, uh, networking resources, or the internet. And applications use cloud computing because uh, cloud uh, because they can uh, provide process those uh, complicated processing, for example, AI or access to aggregated data. Um, Application providers use cloud because cloud is scalable, it's on demand and economic. But this fascinating technology has some limitations. For example, latency sensitive applications such as augmented reality, uh, they require an end to end latency blue uh, 20 millisecond, which is not affordable in uh, cloud systems or bandwidth intensive applications, uh, for example, video surveillance applications, they congest network traffic and therefore they cause latency. Or uh, there are some IoT use cases, for example, in uh, uh, gas leak detection systems that uh, access to a reliable internet connection may be too expensive or even impossible. A natural response to the limitations of the cloud computing is fog computing technology. Fog computing enriches cloud computing with extra resources anywhere along the continuum of cloud to the things. So fog computing provides uh, resources in the close proximity of the users and therefore it decreases latency and network usage. But fog computing also has some limitations some, uh, and it creates some issues. Uh, one of the most important uh, challenges of the fog computing is the security issues. Uh, fog computing inherits most of the security issues of cloud, but it also adds some new uh, security issues. Uh, because of the broader geographic distribution of fog nodes, uh, they are more vulnerable to uh, physical attacks. And on the other hand, as fog machines are designed to be located in close proximity of the user, they have access to the location of the user, which is considered as a personal data. Moreover, fog layer has direct access to the streams of data that are generated from the end user layer and they are sent to the cloud or the commands and responses that are sent from the cloud to the 
end user. Therefore, the applications that they are running on the uh, FOG platform have privileged access to users' data, which may also include personal data. Uh, we have some regulations. For example, in Europe, there is GDPR that mandates those applications that access uh, personal data to expose a privacy policy and explain how they are handling the personal data. But this is not the end of the story, because having a privacy policy does not guarantee the privacy of the users. Uh, in a research in 2020, the authors investigated top 20 most popular Android health applications on Google Play, and they noticed that every single studied application failed to comply with at least part of their own privacy policy claims. So in this thesis, uh, we are uh, focusing on security and privacy issues in the fog computing. Uh, but security and privacy are two broad terms, and we could not cover all the aspects of security and privacy. Therefore, we selected two specific sub-problems in this domain. The first problem is that we know that we will, FOC computing is a new technology and we will witness new FOC systems. Therefore, we need to have a tool, a guideline to uh, assess the security of FOC computing systems. In the, in the, in the first question, uh, our question is how to define a methodology for analyzing the security of the FOC computing systems. After that, we presume that we have reached to a secure FOC computing system, but there are applications that they are running on the FOC computing platforms. And because of the privileged, their privileged access to the personal data, here the question is that how can I check that the application that is running on a FOC computing platform uh, handles my personal data according to its claim in its own privacy we presume that we have reached to a secure for computing for the first system, question which was there about are applications that they are running we on the for computing uh, a methodology and for systematic of analysis of the security of for computing systems and for the second question which was about the how the applications on the for computing environment how they handle the personal data we, our contribution is that we provide a system and methods for automated privacy compliance checking in the FOG environment. Let's just start with the first contribution. Here, the problem is to how to define a methodology for analyzing the security of FOG computing systems. But there are some challenges. The first challenge is that there are uh, for computing is an emerging technology and there will be new for computing system. Each one will have its own specific security issues. On the other hand, generic uh, security evaluation procedures for evaluating IT products, they are uh, costly, they are uh, also time consuming and they are not suited well for the FOG context. And there is no methodological framework for assessing the security of the FOG systems in a systematic way. In the state of the art, there are a lot of words that they discuss about for computing security. We group these words on three main categories. The first group of words, they study uh, an a specific use case of the FOG computing systems and in that specific use case, for example, on health management systems, they also study the security challenges of this use case. Or there are some other research that they, uh, that they uh, study some specific attacks related to the fog computing systems, for example, DDoS attacks. Or there are uh, another group of works that they try, that they provide a survey of all the attacks. They can be exhaustive and provide all the list of attacks, 
or they are trying to provide a taxonomy. For example, a good uh, paper uh, that provides a taxonomy of attack is by Yahuza et al. in 2020. They provide a taxonomy based on the security requirements of the FOX system and the attacks in the FOX system. However, these works, all of them, they do not follow a systematic methodology for analyzing the security of the FOX systems. Here, we use common criteria as an inspiring methodology for our work. Common criteria is in fact an ISO standard for computer security evaluation, and it, it uh, takes the IT products. There are some uh, CC laboratories that they are internationally accepted, and they provide an uh, evaluation assurance level for that product. Uh, so we are going to use this methodology as it is a complete uh, methodology and accept and internationally accepted to base our analysis. In CC, they use some terms such as assets, vulnerabilities, and countermeasures. As we are also using these terms, I'm going to introduce them uh, here. Assets are those entities that the attacker aims to access, and on the other hand, the data, the system owner or the user wants to keep them safe. And vulnerabilities are those exploitable bugs in hardware or software that the attacker uh, can use them to reach its goal. And countermeasures are those security mechanisms to tackle possible attacks. In we, uh, when we wanted to uh, start this analysis on the security of a FOX system, we noticed that we can look at any FOX computing system in three different perspectives. And when we want to analyze the security of a FOX system, we should include all of these uh, perspectives in our analysis. We can look at a FOX system in device level. Here, uh, each uh, FOG node is an individual device with its own uh, logical and physical properties. Or we can look at uh, FOG computing in system level. Here, uh, the FOG computing is a network of those FOG nodes that they, comp uh, that they compose the FOG, the FOG system. Or we can look uh, in service level, here for computing is a system that provides different services to its users. After that, in all of these three perspectives, we uh, provide the, we identify the assets, the vulnerabilities, and whenever it was possible, we also mentioned the countermeasures. In the interest of time, I'm not going into details of this. Uh, uh, analysis, but I uh, refer you to the thesis. After this, we are going to reuse the attack tree and attack defense tree uh, concept as a tool for the security analysis of the system in order to find all the possible ways that an attacker can reach to its goal. Uh, in an attack tree, here uh, intentionally I have separated these two OR gates for more readability. For example, if we assume that the goal of the attacker is to access to the data, we, uh, one of the possible ways is that if the data is stored unencrypted on the fog node or on the cloud server, or if the data is sent in plain text or the network or the credential sent in plain. But as a countermeasure, if, for example, we want to cover these two passes, we can add an asymmetric encryption. And here, the system analyst can see how it covers those two passes uh, to the, uh, in the, uh, for the attacker. For example, if we add uh, like symmetric encryption, it could only cover this uh, branch for the, uh, this route to the tree. So we use this, uh, this tool in our thesis to show the system analyst how to analyze, how to apply it in a real for computing system to see all the possibilities uh, of the uh, security problems in the system. So in conclusion for the first contribution, uh, we talked about uh, the fact that for computing is an emerging technology and we will uh, witness new for computing uh, systems, and each of them will have their own uh, specific security issues. 
as the state of the art lacked methodological frameworks for analyzing the security of a FOX system in a systematic way, we provided this contribution, which was uh, a tailored, uh, which was based on a CC uh, standard. And as uh, during the time that we were working on this contribution, there was no publicly available for computing system. We did not apply this methodology on a real for computing platform, uh, but we applied it on a generic for computing system. Later, we built uh, with other ESRs a for computing platform in, in Valencia, which is publicly available, and it can be a target of, uh, for this uh, methodology. Now let's talk about the second contribution. So here the problem is that we know for computing has privileged access to uh, the personal data. And here the question is that how can I check that the application that is running on the for computing platform is behaving, uh, uh, is handling my personal data according to its claim in its privacy policy. But there are some challenges. The first challenge is that privacy policies are written for humans, not for machines. Typically, they are not written for, uh, for machines. And also, uh, as in a fog computing system, uh, there might be different application uh, deployed every day on them. So we need to be application agnostic to be able to understand how they are behaving uh, according to the, with respect to their privacy policy. And as we are uh, talking in the context of privacy, we, uh, we want to let our approach be as uh, uh, we do not want to be privacy invasive ourselves, and we want to respect the privacy of the user in our approach. So here we can define the problem as how can we check that the application that uh, is behaving according to its uh, privacy policy just by observing the application. Here is our proposed system model. We take the privacy uh, policy and using privacy policy interpretation, we get the behaviors, the expected behaviors or the claims in the privacy policy. And then we have, we monitor the application. By monitoring here, as I mentioned that we want to respect the privacy, we are only observing the application. And we call whatever that we get from observing the application as application signal. For example, network traffic is an application signal. The network traffic that goes into an application or comes out of the application or the CPU usage of the application is an application signal. And then we provide this uh, application signal to a behavior detection engine to infer the, the behavior of the application. And then we compare the observed behavior with the expected behavior. And if there was any mismatch, we can store the application signal for further investigation, which can be done manually. In this thesis, our focus is on monitoring and behavior detection part and other uh, parts of the system is uh, are out of the scope of this thesis. So here, let's uh, uh, let's uh, I will describe you how we build our proof of concept. In order to build our proof of concept, we are going to select one privacy claim and then build uh, and then build uh, a system that is able to automatically check this privacy claim. Here is the taxonomy that is provided by Wilson et al. They studied a lot of privacy policies and they provided this uh, taxonomy. Uh, if, uh, so uh, here, in fact, in every privacy policy, we will see, uh, the, the, we can uh, categorize the claims uh, uh, like this. And here we have selected one specific uh, privacy claim, which is sharing data with third parties. A sharing data with third parties is an important uh, privacy claim, which is also mentioned in GDPR. In fact, it says that if an application wants to share data, the personal data, 
to a third party, for example, an advertising company, it should declare the name of that third party and it should also tell what is going, what type of data is going to be shared with that third party. Uh, so here, let's uh, see how a privacy violation uh, will look like for that uh, privacy claim. Um, so here, uh, assume that in the privacy policy claim, it says that this application only shares audio with third party Y. Here, this schematic shows an abstract view of the FOC computing system, which is distributed and we have different nodes. And when we deploy the application, uh, every application is uh, shown with a different color. Uh, the application is deployed like uh, different replicas and different instances. And here our target application is shown with red circles and the third party with, uh, uh, with gray circles and the other applications with blue circles. So if our target application shares data with the third party and the type of this shared uh, data is audio, it is okay, it is according to the privacy claim. But if our application shares data with any, uh, an, another application, which is not stated in the privacy policy, it is a privacy violation. And if we, the application shares data with a third party, but the type of data is not audio, it's for example, video, it is again a privacy violation. So here we are going to describe how our system is going to detect these uh, behaviors. Um, so on the state of the art for privacy policy interpretation, as I mentioned earlier, there is this taxonomy by Wilson et al. And based on their work, there is a tool called policies that they interpret the privacy policies and with 88% uh, of accuracy, they provide these uh, privacy claims. In monitoring of the applications for privacy checking, there are, we can categorize them in two main groups. Currently, most uh, the, the works are in a smartphone environment. For example, PIOS, which works on uh, checking if the, uh, uh, if the iOS application is behaving according to the license agreement of, uh, of the App Store, they use, uh, uh, they use binary check aesthetic analysis of the binary code of the applications and uh, check this uh, in, in that environment. Or for example, Taint Droid, they follow the flow of sensitive information inside the smartphone in order to see if the phone if the, uh, the, this uh, sensitive data sh uh, leaves the uh, smartphone. Or there is another work that they also uh, are focused on the uh, smartphone environment and they are in fact intercepting those requests to the access management of the Android and they see how, uh, how these sensitive information are handled. They also get other information and other information, for example, privacy, uh, for example, users review on, of that application and tell about the privacy friendliness of that application. But here, to the best of our knowledge, there is no work that focuses on fog and cloud environment. And moreover, we are, as I mentioned earlier, we are interested to be uh, non-intrusive as possible. We want to just be observe the, the, the behavior of the application and do not access to the uh, personal information or go to the code of the, of the uh, applications. And on behavior detection part, here we are going to, in the proof of concept, we assume that the, our uh, uh, application signal is network traffic. On using network traffic for behavior detection, uh, we can group them in two main categories. They, there are works that they are using role-based techniques. For example, the packet inspection techniques, they uh, analyze the network packets, for example, the payloads, uh, in order to understand about the type of data. Uh, but uh, this, uh, uh, this technique is first uh, intrusive uh, because it access to the information inside the packets. And also when the network communication is encrypted, they do not perform well. 
So for the encrypted network communication, they, um, the most uh, techniques are machine learning based. For example, there is a work on 2020 by Lotfa Lariatel that they uh, in fact provide a classify the type of the network encrypted network traffic. Uh, however, they work they, in the multimedia class, they do not cat, uh, differentiate between audio and video because, uh, but, but for our work, which we are talking in the privacy context, there is a, a big difference if the application shares audio or video. So we are also going to use machine learning based techniques for this work, for network traffic uh, classification. And as I mentioned earlier, our focus is on monitoring and behavior detection part in this thesis. So here we put uh, two main assumptions. We assume that the application provider and the end user trust the platform. What it means? It means that the platform runs the application correctly because if it doesn't run it correctly, it wouldn't this uh, checking wouldn't be uh, uh, reliable. And also, we assume that the platform itself will behave according to its privacy policy. We also assume that the applications, because they want to be GDPR compliant, they are willing to be uh, observed by our monitoring system. Uh, and those applications that are malicious and they want to hide and mislead, hide their behavior, they are out of the scope of our work for the moment. Uh, we are going to build our proof of concept on a for computing platform. As for computing is a distributed system, we need an orchestrator to, in fact, manage resources and uh, workloads in this environment. We assume Kubernetes as the orchestrator. Why Kubernetes? Kubernetes is foreseen as the future for computing platform, and it is open source and vendor neutral. <coughs> However, if there is any other orchestrator, as long as uh, we, we can observe, uh, we can access to the network traffic, this uh, procedure can be uh, re reproduced on other orchestrators. Also, here we are building our proof of concept on FOC computing platforms, but the procedure that I'm describing uh, can also be reproduced in cloud systems. So in a FOG uh, cluster in Kubernetes, we have usually we have typically a master node and some worker nodes. And when we deploy applications, they, uh, they will be uh, in different instances and different services uh, in, the, in the nodes. And each application is shown with a different color. And the applications may uh, have some uh, internal communication, each application with itself. So here, our, back to our proof of concept, we wanted to, ch uh, to check that privacy claim, which was telling if the application shares data with a third party and uh, which, uh, with uh, that specific third party, and what is the type of that, uh, that shared data. So here, in order to uh, identify this behavior, we are uh, monitoring the network traffic that are exchange between our application and the rest of the world. Here, the traffic that is shared internally between the instances of the application is shown with the dotted line. It is not our concern, but the traffic that is shared between our application and the rest of the world is our concern. And we, here, we, with the information that we get it from the orchestrator, we uh, build a, a whitelist. And using this whitelist, we are going to we distinguish the internal and external network traffic, and we capture the external network traffic. And here, as today most of the applications uh, encrypt their network traffic, we assume all the applications' uh, network traffic are encrypted. Therefore, we are only capturing the headers of the network traffic. So uh, after we uh, capture this data that is shared between uh, our application and the rest of the world, here we need to also understand about the type of this shared data. To understand about the type of this shared data, we are going to use machine learning, uh, supervised machine learning techniques. So in fact, we 
provide the captured samples uh, to, uh, to a classifier. We are going to build a classifier. And we, at the output, we will be able to understand if the type of this shape data is audio, video, or file, or other. Therefore, we are going to build a classifier. As I mentioned earlier, on encrypted network traffic, the, uh, the, uh, currently they uh, do not distinguish between audio and video, and they only say it is a streaming. Therefore, we have to build our own data set. And we uh, created, uh, we in fact created our own data set, uh, run different applications and captured their network traffic and labeled them according to, uh, to this table. And we, we have also shared our data set for uh, uh, other researchers in this domain. After this step, we are going to train a classifier in order to uh, tell us what is the type of this shared uh, data. We have a list of, we can uh, get a list of features from the network traffic header. And here, in order to find out which subset of features, which uh, uh, classification algorithm, and with which parameters uh, will perform better for our specific classification problem, we wrote a code that was automatically boot forces all of this combination of feature set, uh, classifier algorithm, and the parameters. Uh, after these experiments, we uh, we choose decision tree classifier because it was giving us a better uh, performance result. And our metric for deciding on the parameters and the classifier was F1 score, which provides a balance between precision and recall. Uh, so the details of this uh, classifier and its parameters uh, can be found in our thesis. So here we perform we are going to evaluate our uh, classifier. So we have, uh, we separate the samples in a portion of 80% for training the samples, and we use the remained network traffic samples uh, for testing. And the output is the type of uh, network traffic. Here we reach to 86% of F1 score in classifying the type of data. But then we asked ourselves, what if our monitoring system goes into the wild and we see, our, and the system sees totally new applications? And in this case, our classifier have never been uh, uh, seen and have never been trained with these uh, applications. So in order to simulate this, uh, this situation, we performed another evaluation. Here, we are, uh, uh, we are in fact training our uh, classifier with only 80 with the samples of only 80 percent of applications and we are going to test it with the remained 20 uh, percent uh, with, with the samples of the remain 20 percent of the applications and the result is the same uh, the output traffic type here we get a lower uh, slightly lower f1 score which is 84 percent However, as the problem is a bit uh, harder for the classifier, the result is still promising. In summary, for the second contribution, we talked about uh, this problem that the applications that they are running on a for computing platform, they have privileged access to personal data. Therefore, the question was, how can I check if the application that is uh, running of our computing platforms is behaving according to its own privacy policy claims. Uh, therefore, we sh here we showed the feasibility of automatic privacy compliance checking using the information we get from the hosting platform, which was here the FOG computing platform. And we utilized unintrusive and application agnostic monitoring to understand about uh, the uh, behavior of the application. So in this thesis, we worked on this, uh, the problem of uh, for computing security and privacy issues in two specific sub-problems. We know that for computing is uh, 
an emerging technology and uh, we will witness new for computing system. Therefore, we propose a new methodology for security analysis of for computing systems in a systematic way. And also as the applications that we're running on the Fox platform have access to, uh, have, uh, have privileged access to personal data, we provided an automated privacy compliance checking of FOG applications. This is the list of our publications. Here, we only, in this thesis, we discuss the first two uh, publications, which is a, a journal paper and a conference paper. We did not uh, discuss the two other conference paper, and there is one conference paper that uh, we, we just submitted it in the last weeks. So, on the future research directions for the first contribution, when we were analyzing the security of our computing systems, we assumed that the IoT device is uh, secure. But here, uh, here the, uh, in fact, in order to get to a more realistic uh, situation, uh, we are, in fact, we can assume that, that we can include the, this uh, security problems that comes from IoT device in order to, to get to a, comp a more complete analysis. Also, it would be very useful for the security analysts and also the system designers to have uh, classes of the countermeasures in this analysis. Uh, moreover, as uh, during the time that we were working on the first contribution, there was no publicly uh, available for computing platform, we did not apply our methodology on uh, for computing on a real for computing platform and we applied it on a generic one. However, later in Valencia, in uh, a project called Living Fog with the other ESRs, we built a for computing platform and it is open source, publicly available, and it can be a target of this uh, evaluation. For the second contribution of this thesis, <coughs> Here we only uh, used the network traffic, in fact, encrypted network traffic as the application signal. And we studied the uh, sharing data with third parties as the privacy oriented behavior, but studying other privacy oriented behaviors and also including other application signals would be a very interesting and useful topic uh, to follow. Moreover, in our assumptions, we assume that malicious applications are out of the scope of this research for the moment. However, uh, we can predict with the prevalence of such systems, there might be applications that they want to mislead the monitoring and hide their behaviors. Therefore, researching this topic in order to detect these uh, applications uh, would be also a very challenging and interesting topic to follow. Here on classification of the type of data, uh, although we provided a finer grained classification in the multimedia type, however, uh, there is a need in the privacy context to be able to un identify the type of the personal data or, uh, or it, it, it might seem too ambitious, but it is a very useful uh, research for this context. And in this thesis, we uh, use supervised machine learning techniques in order to uh, classify, to understand about the type of shared network traffic. Uh, however, applying other, uh, other techniques in machine learning for this uh, privacy detection uh, uh, question would be a very interesting topic for the uh, scientists and researchers in the machine learning domain. Here we build our proof of concept on using a for computing platform, but uh, applying the same procedures on another platform such as cloud, it, it would be a very interesting and also useful, uh, useful topic to, uh, to research on, to, to apply it on. And also uh, providing uh, privacy compliance for the monitoring system itself is a very useful 
a research line uh, to, to, to be followed. So thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, I would be glad to answer them. Okay, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Uh, very didactic and very easy to follow. Uh, we'll start with the session of questions and answers. And we'll start with the manuscript reviewers. And uh, Pierre, would you like to start with your questions? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. President. First of all, uh, I would like to congratulate uh, most then for the quality of your, of your presentation. It's a very clear and pedagogical presentation. Thank you. And um, as I wrote in my report, you address um, a very important and timely issue. On, and uh, having some tools for checking a uh, fog environment is uh, very important for the community. Naturally, I have some questions. It's the game. Um, uh, first of all, about your um, generate your systematic approach. In fact, I'm not totally convinced of the generality of your approach. Your, your presentation for, in the manuscript, I, I, the chapter four of your manuscript is very high level. And I'm not uh, sure it covers uh, all uh, FOG applications. For instance, if I want to implement uh, a reliable storage uh, using replication, how to check the consistency of, of replication and so on. So. Um, I'm wondering uh, for which kinds of, of application your approach is, is relevant, and do you characterize different type of application you can apply your approach? Uh, mm, so your question is is about this the first contribution or the second one? The, the first contribution. Which is the security analysis of Fox. The security, yes, about the generator of your approach, for which kind of uh, real application you can ap apply your approach. Yes. So, so here in in the first uh, for the first contribution, in fact, uh, our target of uh, our target is a for computing system, uh, and not only the applications of a for. Uh, that may run on a fog computing system. Here we, uh, for example, we are looking at the fog in different perspectives, uh, in device, even the physical properties of the fog system. Or, uh, so here we are not only, uh, in fact, uh, uh, targeting the applications, but in general, uh, we are uh, providing a framework in order to uh, to be able to cover all the aspects of the fog computing system that that may need that may be uh, uh, provide a vulnerability to the whole system. So, in fact, in order to to be uh, uh, complete in our uh, in our procedure as much as possible, we rely on common criteria, which is an internationally accepted, well-established uh, security evaluation procedure, which is uh, designed to be exhaustive. And therefore, we are uh, using the, the methodology that they, uh, that they introduce uh, in this standard. And we follow this, uh, this uh, for our analysis. OK, OK, thank you. Um, <laughs> Another question is um, concerning your perspective. Um, for, uh, actually, you consider in your attack model, you assume that devices and communication channels between the um, device and fog are secure. And uh, you, you plan to extend your, your treat model to Byzantine behavior. How do you have some uh, idea how to do that? Uh, what kind of uh, algorithm you, you use? Or can you elaborate a little bit? Uh, yes, in fact, um, in uh, in our state of the in our uh, assumptions in our threat model, we assumed that the uh, that the fog that the IoT device is secure and also the communication to the fog node because mostly the IoT devices may have uh, some weak processing uh, capabilities and they may not be able to. Uh, to perform those uh, cryptographic uh, calculations that are needed for the cryptographic protocols. Therefore, uh, 
if we look uh, in in fact here we we also uh, uh, mentioned here on the future research directions that uh, for example removing this assumption that also the iot device is uh, may have some security uh, problems uh, it, it also including this fact uh, would be uh, useful to to reach to a realistic view uh, for I would say uh, I can. I mean, uh, it is in fact as we assume it is uh, uh, for the current situation of the IoT devices. Uh, we have put this assumption, but I can speculate that, for example, with uh, um, if we reach to more powerful uh, and the uh, IoT devices and the process and having processing would uh, for even. Uh, uh, small IoT devices would be possible, we can also uh, empower them with, uh, for example, cryptographic uh, um, uh, uh, protocols to, to in order to communicate with the fog node. But another thing is that if you look at fog computing as a security solution, if we uh, because fog is one of the, in fact, one of the uh, goals of fog computing was to uh, provide these uh, this, uh, cryptographic capabilities for weak IoT devices. In fact, uh, if uh, the fog is located in a very close proximity of the IoT device, uh, it can outsource this. Uh, we can assume that the communication to the fog node is secure. And from fog to the cloud, uh, this uh, uh, this uh, um, encryptions and this uh, encryption of the channel may happen. Okay. So. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, another question about your um, the second part of your uh, of your contribution. Your second contribution. Sorry. Yes. Um, so you you adopt a supervised learning approach. Uh, practically, is it difficult to generate the labels or and how you, you plan to extend your approach to a non-supervised approach? Uh, so, uh, in the state of the art, they, there are works that, for example, on uh, uh, here, let me go. So, for example, this work uh, that's provided by, in 2020, they uh, provide this uh, classification of, for example, network uh, traffic type with uh, deep learning methods. And uh, they, uh, in fact, uh, here uh, we are not using, uh, we are just uh, provided a, a data set, created this data set and use supervised learning. But uh, if uh, I would say, maybe not supervised uh, learning, but uh, for example, techniques that are based on uh, deep learnings, uh, which they need a more bigger data set, but uh, 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 based on the, the other works in the state of the art in this, uh, in the in classification of the network traffic, maybe for example, deep learning techniques would be, uh, would uh, lead to also uh, better result, but as a, uh, my uh, my main uh, uh, contribution, I, I, I mean my my main field of study is not machine learning uh, techniques, and we use it as a tool here for for our uh, privacy compliance checking. We did not go to the direction of using, for example, deep learning or other state of the art uh, uh, techniques in the machine learning. Okay, but, um, as far as I understand, you use um, a decision tree a classifier. Yes. And uh, do you have compared your approach with, with other classifiers and you have uh, some results to show us? Yeah, in fact, uh, here, for example, uh, as the classes that they provide in the network traffic classification, we didn't find uh, another uh, similar work that do this this fine grained classification for the privacy purpose. Uh, we cannot uh, uh, exactly compare the results, but for example, here this work that uh, the, the classes they provide are coarse grained, 
uh, but uh, for, and and they use, uh, for example, deep learning techniques. They reach to uh, ninety six percent in their uh, percent of a final score in uh, the uh, in fact that course grade classification. But having the exactly the same classes that we needed for our privacy uh, purpose, we didn't we we didn't find similar uh classification and therefore uh, yeah it is the more closest uh, thing okay. that you mentioned us but in your experiments do you do you test uh, i'm surprised you don't use for instance uh, some uh, random forest approach which is classical do you 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 use only one tree uh, uh, no no, uh, no? yes uh, let me show you the slide um, i don't understand so here we in fact in order to find out which uh, classifier algorithm performs better, we provide we, we wrote a code that was good for seeing uh, this, uh, for example, even uh, the uh, random forest decision tree, uh, other other classifier algorithms with uh, other uh, parameters and also subsets of the features. So it was brute forcing here, the, our code was brute forcing all the possible combinations. And finally, we noticed that uh, with a decision tree classifier for our specific uh, classification problem, uh, we could reach to a better result. Therefore, we use this, uh, 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 this algorithm, but we also uh, checked the uh, uh, okay. mentioned yes. Yeah, because in in your manuscript you don't give uh, the performance of over classifier. Yes. Of classifier. So it's why my question. Yes. Okay, okay I understand now. Um, uh, maybe a last question. Um, as far as I understand, you have um, a centralized uh, classifier. You're running your classifier on a remote cloud. No. Uh, uh, the classifier. Yeah. So, the classifier is run on the remote cloud uh, and uh, for scalability co could you consider to have a more distributed approach to show as a fed federated uh, machine learning or something like this with different uh, classifier and synchronization between the classifiers mm -hmm. so in fact uh, uh, the classification we have this uh, step of training that uh, uh, for the training part uh, we uh, use uh, 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 an offline training. We, we uh, perform this classification, this training on the on our laptop, on the laptop. And for the testing, we had this uh, when the we have this Raspberry Pis set up as the fog nodes. We have a cluster of ten Raspberry Pis, and we were uh, in fact I was running the uh, the classifier, the, the model that was trained offline on the laptop uh, i have the model on the uh, raspberry pis on the fog nodes and when they were running and capturing the network traffic after that we had this step that was classifying the type of this uh, network traffic but uh, uh, as we are in the distributed environments i think it is a, a good idea to also uh, uh, in, in as a future work, also use uh, these federated learning techniques, as you mentioned. Okay, thank you for your response. I'm done. Thank you again. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Pierre. Uh, we now move to the second manuscript reviewer, Kevin. Thanks. Um, thank you for the presentation, was It was indeed uh, uh, pretty clear. I have uh, a couple of questions about your presentation. So the first one is more about uh, the general framing of the problem. So you, you've been, uh, you kept talking about uh, privacy and the fact that, and the way you define privacy is, is very close to, um, to GDPR's definition, which is essentially um, data relating to an um, identified or identifiable person. Uh, my question is, why did you focus on the privacy of persons? What, what about the confidentiality of, uh, I don't know, like uh, corporate data or so on? C could you maybe explain why you focused on personal data of individual and not of organization? And how would that be different if you had to tackle this? Or why is this useless to look at this? Uh, so thank you for your question. Uh, 
So your question is that why we have uh, used, we have uh, targeted the personal data, not the information that are related to uh, uh, sensitive data for a company uh, and so on. So here, in fact, uh, we are, as we are in the FOG context, one of the important, uh, important challenges is that when we locate a, a FOG machine in close proximity of the user, these uh, devices are designed to, in fact, pre-process the data of the user and then send it to the cloud. Therefore, we can assume that most of the, 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 the work that these FOG nodes are not... Sorry? Sorry? No, uh, I'm listening. Yes. yes. Uh, so... There, there is some there echo. Is echo. Okay. Probably you need to, someone need to switch off the audio if. Yeah, so can I, I just uh, switch off your audio? Don't forget to switch it on again uh, when you have questions. Uh, so in the, uh, so FOG in fact designed to pre-process the data before sending it to the cloud. And this data, when we are in the close proximity of the end user, it's, uh, the, the thing that is important is uh, personal data. And so uh, here we focused on personal data and its compliance with uh, the privacy policy. Uh, but as you mentioned about the, the data that is important for the industry, for, I can speculate that, uh, I mean, we, our scope is in the thesis is defined on the personal data, but I can speculate that, for example, in the IoT sensors, for example, uh, we, we may have some use cases that this data is so sensitive because it is going to be used, for example, for control of a uh, uh, of uh, an industry for or another another task that are uh, that they are uh, that may cause some uh, problems if this data has been uh, accessed. Um, so here, uh, in fact, it is a good uh, good suggestion to also include other type of data, but we need uh, to have some some specification in order to check against it if uh, we need to, to, to define some specification that, for example, this sensitive data, which is related to an industry, uh, might, be, uh, might be handled in such a way, and therefore we check this, uh, this behavior. Uh, but uh, yeah, in, in the thesis, our focus was on the personal data. Okay, thank you. Um, my second question is more about the positioning of the, the first contribution. So you, you had this nice diagram where you explain you know, what the, all the contribution that have been done by, by others in uh, systemat systematizing the, the knowledge around uh, Fox security. So my first question uh, is, what's the difference between your work and Yaruza? Or maybe they were just published at the same time. Maybe you can elaborate on this. And my other question is, um, it's a more general question. Uh, how, how do we evaluate the, um, let's say, uh, such a work? How do you know that when you do a terminal taxonomy, how do you know that it's a good one, right? I mean, like when you propose a new protocol, you very often have metrics. So you evaluate it, you compare it to uh, related work and so on and so forth. Here, my question is, um, how do you know that what you produce, you produce makes sense? And how do you evaluate the quality of a taxonomy or of a, uh, uh, literature review beyond the peer reviewed that you uh, successfully went through but overall how do you achieve that could you could you elaborate on those two questions please yes so for the first question on uh, how our work is uh, different for example for for other works for example yahoo et al in 2020 work so here for example the, the papers that they are providing a taxonomy of the security uh, issues in a for computing system in fact they are uh, uh, for example this work they are providing a taxonomy based on the security requirements of a FOX system or the security attacks in a FOX system. Uh, however, they 
we are following a, a CC as the methodology. We are uh, beginning this in order to define what is important for us as an asset to protect and what is uh, and how we should uh, how uh, what are the vulnerabilities how we can protect them therefore we are following a, a cc as it is uh, a well established uh, security evaluation procedure and uh, as cc is uh, is in fact accepted in the community for uh, for being exhaustive and covering the, all the aspects we are uh, also following this uh, this method however it is for evaluating which which says they take a, a, a specification and they want to check the, the the system against that specification but here we do not have such a specification for a fog computing system in order to check it against that one therefore uh, at least we could use this methodology as it is a complete and well known uh, a standard in this uh, in this domain in order to try to be uh, to also cover it as much as cover all the aspects as much as possible uh, but uh, we cannot uh, for example provide a number or or proof that our uh, that our uh, methodology is covering all the aspects because it is uh, as, as also CC cannot, uh, uh, I mean, cannot, cannot prove itself. The proof is that we are relying on, on CC. And uh, uh, also, in fact, the, the person that is going to use our methodology should uh, take care of how they, they use our methodology in order to not forget uh, the, the, the assets that we have mentioned to them. Uh, to to reach to a complete uh, analysis of the FOG system. Thank you very much. Uh, can you go back to the previous slide, the slide 12? Yes. Yeah, I can see that you anticipated that I would ask this question, as I can see in the, uh, in the PowerPoint comment. Good. Um, let me move to another question. Could you go to the slide with the attack tree? A slide with the attack tree? Uh, might be this one. So, yeah, here I'm, I'm a bit confused with your, your example. So here you have one input that is, I, I know it's just an example, but uh, uh, here, you, no, not the other one. There was another one, I think. With oh, yeah. So here, I'm not sure I understand. I mean, on the one hand, you have data sent in plain text. Yes. And, and then like uh, one input that is called asymmetric encryption. So. To me, it sounds a bit contradictory. I mean, like one of your input already contains information about whether encryption is used or not. And then you have another input in, in your uh, attack tree that specifies whether asymmetric encryption is used or not. So um, I, I'm not sure I understand essentially how this, how to yeah. read the, the tree and, and yeah. Yes. So in fact, here we are adding this uh this uh, countermeasure as having asymmetric encryption because in the in in here here we do not have this countermeasure but when we add this countermeasure for example we use asymmetric encryption for the data before sending it in the network uh, it will if we use uh, asymmetric encryption it will cover it will it will cause to stop this route for the attacker and on the other hand, on the asymmetric encryption, as we do not need to exchange the keys in plane, uh, so it, it also covers these passes uh, for the attacker. Uh, so here, in fact, uh, this, is, uh, this is in fact implementing or having asymmetric encryption for our system. I hope uh, I answered your question. Okay. Um, at some point you, you mentioned, so I mean, like your second contribution is based on uh, checking the behavior of, of the applications, right? Mm -hmm. um, so what you call the behavior is what can be observed from the outside, right? Uh, uh, the, the behavior, uh, in fact, so, we, we, we call application signal, 
uh, as the result of the monitoring, what can be observed? Okay, um, so for for some of the contribution for some of the related work that you mentioned, especially on smartphones, uh, I think one of them relies on static analysis, right? Yes. Um, the one of PyOS, I think it relies on on, um, on static analysis. So, could you explain maybe why this wasn't possible here, or could it have been possible, and uh, what would have been the difference, and and so on? Why did you opt for this? Uh, let's say. Uh, uh, yeah, dynamic analysis based on uh, signals emitted by the application at runtime. Yes. So here on the PIOS, in fact, they, as you mentioned, they are using a static analysis. They take the binary code of the uh, of the application and then they try to to draw the model of the. Uh, of the application, the graph of the flow of the sensitive information inside the application in order to see how the application handles personal data. But uh, one of the, uh, the issues that they had in this work was that they were, uh, they were having this problem to provide the, uh, the, the codes that are written within specific programming languages. They were only uh, working with C and object C, uh, as I remember for this work. But in a cloud and fog environment, we have these containerized applications that they are running on, uh, that they may come from different, uh, they are containerized, they, can, they may be written with different languages and use different libraries. And another thing is that in the fog and cloud, we do not have this source of sensitive information which we have in the uh, smartphones. For example, in, in even in Taint Droid and also PIOS, they have, they can, get uh, where the sensitive information comes from, for example, the GPS, the, the location of the phone, and follow, uh, follow how, how the sensitive information flows. But on the fog and cloud environment, we, got, we, we receive the data. We do not uh, know where is this, the source of the data. And we are, we, if we consider it as, a, as something that also includes personal data, then we have to, uh, to for example, apply our uh, method in order to understand if it is uh, privacy uh, compliant or not. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, here, uh, it's probably my fault, I don't remember exactly, but when you mentioned uh, the, the privacy policy interpretation part, so how, how is it done? Is it done uh, like um, manually or is it done automatically? Um, could, could you maybe uh, elaborate on this? Yes, on uh, the privacy uh, policy interpretation, in fact, are uh, here as I, as here the, the, our scope of the work is on monitoring and behavior detection part, but on the privacy policy interpretation in the state of the art, there is a, there is a tool called policies and they are using natural language processing techniques in order yeah. to, to uh, analyze the, the, the privacy policy text and they provide uh, the, these, uh, these privacy claims that are in fact the privacy principles uh, that are provided by Wilson et al. So it is a tool, it is an autom automatic tool that... Uh, Policies by Arcus et al, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, my last question is about um, the techniques that you use, uh, the machine learning techniques that you use for uh, classifying the, um, the, 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 the application uh, based on the encrypted traffic. So uh, there, there is, in the security and privacy community, there's a, an abundant literature on uh, traffic analysis in general, and in particular, one thing that is called uh, website fingerprinting, uh, essentially being able to know which website is visited or which type of application is running based on the encrypted traffic. So, did you look? Did you take a look at this, and how would your technique compare to those existing works? Because they are like really uh, uh, plenty in, in in my community, I would say, mostly for website fingerprinting, but also for uh, traffic uh, classification, I would say. Yes. So here on the on the state of the art. <clears throat> on the in fact. Uh, 
uh, using uh, uh, network traffic to, to understand about the, the application or the, or the data type that is shared. Uh, in fact, this, this work that is uh, by Lotto La Yetal, they, they are also able to uh, identify the application type. Here in our work, we, we also had this, uh, we also implemented this classifier that was able to tell us what is the name of the application that have generated this data. But in, uh, and we, we looked into, the, into this approach, but at, at some point we decided that knowing about the name of the application and what is the what is the website what is the application that has generated this data uh, will not be something that we can uh, that we might want to use for our uh, for our proof of concept because here what was uh, important for us was that what if the what, whatever the application is and what, what uh, it has generated it is important for us to know that what uh, what is the type of the data that has been shared uh, so uh, in fact uh, yes uh, I, I have looked into the uh, these words but we are uh, mainly our focus here is to understand about the type of the traffic because on the uh, when we want to uh, identify the for example third party and also here if we, uh, when we want to uh, understand about the sharing data for example with the third party we are using the information that we get from our orchestrator uh, we, we build a whitelist in order to uh, to understand if the traffic is internal or the traffic is external. As long as it's it's external, then we start that uh, machine learning techniques to understand about the type of the network traffic. Okay. Um, about that, I have two further questions. The first one is the result that you gave for the, the, the accuracy of your classifier. They look, they seem to be in a closed world environment, right? Uh, closed world. Uh, By closed world, I, uh, your tool already knows in what list the application is. So you're trying to find out which application it is among a fixed set of 12 or whatever applications, right? This is called closed world. Closed world means you already know the set of all potential candidates, right? But the number of applications out there is uh, virtually infinite, right? So, uh, how would you? So, could you confirm that what you did was indeed in closed world? And how how do you think your performance would evolve in real world? And yeah, yes. how would you yes. do that if you don't already know like a small set of usual suspects for the uh, the applications? Yes, in fact, it is a very interesting question because here we we are going we trained our classifier with the samples of different applications. Uh, for example, we just uh, trained here with eighty percent of the applications and then tested it against uh, these uh, samples. And uh, but here we also had this question that what if uh, our a classifier gets an, a sample when it, when it goes into the into the real world and it uh, gets some traffic from a completely new application that has never seen before. So to simulate this situation, we did the second evaluation. Here we trained our classifier with the samples of only eighty percent of the applications. So the rem so when we are testing, in fact, the classifier has never seen the samples from those remained applications, and uh, we, uh, in fact, here the result is a little bit lower, eighty four percent, comparing to this one, eighty six. But we we have in fact uh, predicted that twelve, and then you test it with the remaining two applications, it will always be incorrect, right? Uh, so here, we, in fact, we are not, uh, in fact, the output is the traffic type, not the application name. So, uh, so in fact, we are going to... Audio, audio and so on, right? Yes. Yeah. What... Yes. Now I get it. Okay. And my last question is, um, uh, like in security... Very short Sorry. question, Kevin, please. I must be quick. That's what you're saying? 
could you have a very short question, last question? Many things. Okay. So we often say that security is a cat and mouse game, right? I mean, you have a problem, then you propose a countermeasure, and then another attack, and then a new countermeasure. So uh, here, did you evaluate how your the accuracy of your inference system here for inferring the traffic type would behave if uh, the adversary, so the, the, the person developing the application, um, I mean, would implement some countermeasures not to be detected or to, to fool your uh, uh, traffic type classifier? Yes, it is also, in fact, uh, one thing that we have uh, uh, talked about it in the in the assumptions and also in the future research directions because currently applications want to to be to show that they are gdpr compliant and we assume for the moment that they do not want to hide or uh, their behavior but yes in fact indeed the, the these uh, malicious applications that they are intentionally want to hide their behavior would be as you mentioned a mouse and cat problem and it, it it would be we need to uh, uh, in fact work on this uh, on this uh, line of research in order to also be able to identify the behavior of these type of malicious applications okay i'm done thank you thank you thank you very much kevin uh, we now move to the two examinators of the PhD uh, defense, and we start with Claudia Inia. Claudia, please. Yes, yes. Hello, everybody. So first, uh, thank you, Guillaume and Daniele, for the invitation to join the PhD defense committee of uh, Mojdeh. Uh, and then, uh, Mojdeh, thank you for your clear presentation and also the manuscript that I found uh, easy to read. Uh, I also want to congratulate you that um, uh, for getting to this point of defending the thesis, uh, I think it must have been difficult to uh, to do your PhD during pandemic. <laughs> yeah, so uh, now my questions. Uh, first about uh, your first contribution. Uh, so it's somehow related to one of the questions of Kevin. So I would like to know what methodology did you apply to obtain the list of vulnerabilities in the, in the security of computing, how are you sure that you obtained an exhaustive list? So by methodology here, I mean, uh, what did you exactly do? Did you do a state of the art or what exactly did you do? Yes. Uh, yes, in fact, uh, in order to cover all the vulnerabilities, we, we in fact, first uh, looked at the fog in the the all different perspectives that we could think about it. And then we find the assets of the of the Fox system that they are entities that they want that we want to protect. And then on the vulnerabilities for each of the assets, we tell, we looked at the state of the art for the current vulnerabilities that and we mentioned them in in the uh, in the manuscript. However, we know that this uh, research line, that the security problem, it is going to be updated. There might be new uh, new uh, challenges, and uh, and we also in our methodology, we also mentioned to the to the reader of the work, which would be the security analyst or the system designer of the Fox system, that they also need to get uh, to check the state of the art for the possible new. Uh, uh, new vulnerabilities that might be uh, found in this domain. Okay, so uh, then, uh, for instance, for um, among the vulnerabilities that you identified, uh, which are specific to fog computing and are not valid, for instance, to cloud computing? Yes. Can you mention some of them? Yes. Uh, so, in fact, in the fog computing, one of the one of the new one of the uh, most relevant uh, vulnerabilities is because due to the fact that the fog systems are designed to be in a broader geographic locations and near to the to, in the close proximity of the user therefore they are more vulnerable to physical attacks and therefore because of the lack of uh, surveillance on those machines so here on the uh, fog we have this problem of most the problems that it sent from the physical uh, attacks. 
so it is one of the things. And another thing is that uh, the location of the user uh, here, because uh, Fog is designed to be in the close proximity, uh, in the proximity of the user, uh, the Fog nodes, in fact, uh, have uh, approximate location about the user, which and location is the is a personal data, and we have we can I can mention these two uh, main uh, uh, vulnerabilities that are related to the fog context. Okay, um, so you discussed the uh, issues uh, in security of fog computing, but uh, also by reading your manuscript, I didn't find any mention of, about access control. Uh, so, which access control mechanism uh, do you think it's suitable for for computing without having to rely on a, on a central authority? Uh, so, in fact, uh, in the um, in the uh, in our analysis, we provided assets and vulnerabilities, and whenever it was possible, we also mentioned to the countermeasures. But as you mentioned, we uh, do not provide a class for countermeasures, and it was stated in our future research directions to also provide classes for countermeasures uh, that may be applied for the FOG systems. On the other side, on the other hand, for the, for the access control mechanisms, that we, we may want to have in a fog uh, in a fog system. When we look in the service level, we, we have this, uh, we, here we are talking about different services that, uh, uh, that, that fog nodes can provide. And to access, to provide access to these services, we need to uh, provide uh, some access controls here. And this, uh, this would be in this category of the service level of the FOG, uh, FOG computing platforms. Uh, but yeah, maybe we, ha we have not specifically ma uh, mentioned to this uh, as a countermeasure because uh, we, we do not provide the taxonomy for the countermeasures here. OK, thank you. And now about uh, your second contribution. So uh, you mentioned also in your slides and also in the manuscript, the data sharing with third party, this principle that is the, at the heart of European uh, GDPR. Yes. Um, wh what kind of data types uh, do you mean by there? I have the impression that uh, your, your solution uh, is only focused on video and audio streaming, mostly. While uh, for me, uh, the, the, um, the, privacy, uh, the privacy policies of GDPR can also uh, concern finer granularity data, such as, for instance, if you have uh, personal data, it can be, uh, I can have a privacy rule saying, okay, you can, uh, you can exchange uh, the age of the person, but not the name and the address. So, um, can you comment on that? I, I think you don't uh, deal with this uh, fine granularity data, yes? Uh, so, uh, in fact, uh, on the specific on the privacy claims for data sharing, we have to also be trans uh, be also transparent about the type of data that is going to be shared. And here, we are the classes that we provide are comparing to the state of the art in this uh, in this work we are providing a finer grained classification because we also we are on the multimedia we, we, we are able to uh, categorize audio and video other than that we are able to understand if it is the file that is going to, to be uh, exchanged and another and others this, these four these are the four classes but uh, I agree to the fact that on the privacy context, we need to, for example, be able to see if the age of the person is shared or the location and so on. And as in, the, in our state of the art, I mentioned we, we, we need to be uh, to, to have fi even finer grained classifications for, uh, for this privacy context. Uh, but uh, currently, Comparing to the state of the art using the encrypted network traffic, uh, we have this contribution to, to distinguish between audio and video 
but I agree that uh, it would be very more uh, useful and very, very more realistic in, in the privacy context to also be able to, for example, uh, identify if an age is shared or the location and so on. Yes, thank you. Um, then, um, in your manuscript, um, you talk about the reference uh, Dropper Hill in 2016 on characterization of encrypted and VPN traffic using uh, time relating the features. And uh, uh, they are the authors proposed classification for encrypted traffic for several classes. They listed chat, email, file transfer, streaming, voice of, over IP, torrent, and so on. Uh, they have uh, several classes. But you mentioned that uh, these classes of data types are far from the requirements uh, from uh, privacy policies. Okay, so I, I would like to know why, because they seem to have more classes than you have. They include uh, audio and uh, video. Um, I suppose it's just because they cannot distinguish between audio and video? So, in fact, this uh, this uh, work in the state of the art, I guess you are mentioning the work by uh, uh, Lutfer Layetal, I guess. So, the, in fact, the, the target of their work is, uh, is different because they want to classify the network traffic type for uh, uh, for providing information, for example, for uh, increasing the, the quality of service in the ISPs to know if the user has uh, used VPN or not, if the, the type of the communication they are using, for example, chat for, uh, to, to increase the quality of service in these uh, use cases. So the classes, yes, they, they, they have more number of classes, but in the privacy context, what we need, if, if for example, someone is using VPN uh, or, for example, if they are using, if they are chatting, is not uh, what we uh, want, uh, what we need in the privacy context. As you mentioned in, in your previous question, uh, those uh, those classes like age or location, audio and video, these these make sense in the privacy context, and. Uh, uh, yeah, in that work, they were calling it audio and video as a streaming, and they did not distinguish it. But uh, I agree that they had more classes for that specific uh, use case they had. Okay, my next question is uh, about uh, the features you defined uh, in the mas machine learning solution that you proposed. Uh, so how did you define those features? Uh, and uh, which ones of the ones that you proposed are, are the most important? Did you do some uh, some work around that? Uh, let me go to the slide. Because I suppose th those are the final ones, uh, but before I, I suppose you tried with many others. So how did you obtain them? So in fact, we as we are using encrypted network traffic, we are uh, only capturing the header of the network traffic. And on the header, we use the statistical uh, analysis. Uh, we, we use a statistical analysis of the traffic for the two minutes of a communication for those these applications that we have listed here. So, uh, and then we provide, for example, the delta time between the packets. The, uh, for example, uh, the the mean value of the delta time. The uh, STD of the delta time and these all of these uh, features that we extract from the headers of the first two minutes and then in order to find out which of these features will perform better we did a brute force uh, brute force experiment we were uh, in fact uh, using all the combinations of the subsets of these features that can uh, uh, provide us a better performance result. But then why, why did you choose the first 10 packets, for instance, and not 15? Uh... So yes, here we, in fact, by looking at the network traffic, we have, uh, we, we separated, in fact, the first 10 packets with the, the next 200 packets because we wanted to, because we, we had this, uh, 
yes, that in the first uh, packets, they are exchange some traffic to, to, uh, to establish the communication channel. So we differentiated this, uh, we in fact separated these packets to have uh, as, as a feature in our, uh, in our feature sets to, uh, to also in, include it later in that brute force uh, experiments. Okay, so for the evaluation, um, you propose to use 80% um, uh, of the data as training and 20 as uh, uh, as testing. Uh, so why why you didn't use uh, cross validation? Uh, for instance, five fold cross validation, you would have more data for that. Why didn't you use that? It would In have fact? been very easy to do. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, it it includes cross validation. In the training, we are separating the training with 80% and inside that 80% of the data we are cross validating and then we are uh, in fact i only described how the, i told only training and testing but the training as you mentioned is a cross validation uh, okay. yes okay okay so, and my last question uh, i've seen uh, you have some work on a blockchain so why not proposing maintaining security info computing based on blockchain solution. So for instance, if you compare with um, your work on uh, vulnerabilities of your first contribution, uh, which vulnerabilities would remain unsatisfied uh, uh, when using a blockchain solution? So here in this thesis, we only focus on the first two publications uh, that I described in the thesis. But uh, yes, we worked on a blockchain uh, solution for uh, at, at, at the beginnings of my thesis. I, I started with uh, studying on the blockchain to provide data security in the IoT section. Uh, and it is also an, a very active research line because, uh, because it is a new technology and there are uh, a lot of researchers working on these subjects. But at some point, uh, yeah, it, it, in fact, it, we had provided this idea uh, to, to use blockchain for data security. But uh, we this, I mean, I decided to, to focus on uh, more on the fog and cloud systems. And uh, this, uh, this, is, this might be, as you mentioned, a different solution for the security problems in the FOX systems. Okay, thank you. I'm done with my questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, um, Todia. And we now move to Alessandra Toninelli. Alessandra. Hi. Thanks, uh, Guillaume, uh, and congratulations to Osdef for your presentation and your PhD work. Uh, I have some questions, uh, mostly on the second contribution. Uh, some of the topics have already been discussed, of course, but I would uh, ask some clarifications. So uh, you, um, you show in one slide the taxonomy provided by Wilson of the privacy claims. Yeah, I think that, yeah, exactly that one. And you picked uh, the third party sharing uh, uh, of data as a, let's say, the, the use case uh, for your approach. I was wondering um, which other claims in this taxonomy uh, you think would be a uh, candidate for your approach to be applied? I mean, uh, the approach is based on there's a lot of like network traffic analysis. <laughs> I mean, it, to be very, to put it in simple words, do you think uh, there are other privacy claims in here that could be uh, addressed uh, uh, in an effective way uh, by adopting your approach. Uh, yes, here we focus on the third party data sharing. Uh, but for example, on the data security approach, if in fact, if we do not want to use network traffic as the application signal, uh, for example, I can speculate for, uh, to uh, check the data security. We may want to use, uh, for example, the CPU usage or after that and combine it with, uh, for example, the, the network traffic in order to see because, because for example, in, GD, in 
privacy policies, one of the requirements is to, uh, for example, before sharing data, you should encrypt it. Or uh, the data before, to, uh, before shared with a destination, there should be a, an authentication should happen. Uh, so if we, if we want to use other application signals, for example, or, the, or if we uh, use the system calls to the encryption uh, system calls in the fog node to request for encryption, we can uh, have this, uh, this idea that if the data has been encrypted before uh, sharing to uh, provide the, the, uh, for example, this other privacy claim here. Okay, so uh, the, the other question is somehow the, the other way around. So uh, my question is, what do you think is uh, specific to privacy uh, in your approach? I mean, as I said, we, we are analyzing application signals uh, and some of these techniques, of course, also are also used in network monitoring. So what do you think is specific uh, in your approach, specific to privacy? What makes it uh, particularly uh, you know, um, conceived for privacy protection, something that um, cannot be uh, applied to or set off generic network monitoring? Uh, so your question is that, uh, uh, what is the difference of our work with uh, with generic monitoring, uh, network monitoring? And kind of yes. What what is what? Why why is it good for privacy? Why I mean, so where is the contribution? And and it's better to use this than existing work on network on network monitoring. Yeah, exactly. That's the question. Uh, so here, so for example, here we were. Uh, for example, here we are using the network traffic in order to understand about a behavior. But but even defining defining this uh, this model in order to to have all these elements like monitoring in the fog level and getting information from the host. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, similar to the monitorings in general, uh, it is it, it is similar, but uh, combining it and having some meaning from it in order to uh, understand about the privacy behavior is where our work is differentiated differentiated from a, 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 a monitoring. So, in fact, in in the state of the art. There are works that they do monitoring in the platform layers for, for example, in order to increase the performance of the system. Uh, but none of them are using this information that they are available on the platforms uh, in order to understand about an important question that we have about what these applications are doing with our data. So combining and proposing this model that is able to infer about the behavior of, of the applications that are monitored is where uh, I would say we can differentiate our work from only monitoring the, the applications. Okay, thanks. And I have another question. Uh, Regarding uh, um, so the classification uh, of uh, types of data, basically you have so video, audio, and then in, in file, and and in the other category, we have uh, I mean I think we might have a, a bunch of applications that uh, exchange uh, data, uh, but my concern is. Um, Actually, it's something that was already um, a concern raised by Claudia as well. So uh, as long as we stick to audio, video, file, that's okay. But, you know, in the other category, we might have a, a data exchange where the uh, actual data matters. So, so do you think this kind of approach would uh, eventually have to be integrated with, um, let's say, 
application specific approach applic um, approaches that uh, tackle the semantics of the data that are exchanged to be effective or you think that somehow it would be possible to provide a characterization also I mean a more more detailed one for these other applications because in most cases those others uh, exchange a lot of data and the, the specific data is relevant so uh, I wonder if uh, we in the end would need to integrate this kind of approach with an application specific one which of course might be more invasive uh, or if you have already thought of possible um, further investigation to, to cover the other application scenario so to say mm -hmm. uh, yes i uh so you, you you what you are saying is that the classes that we provide are uh, only audio video file and other and we have plenty of other uh, privacy data that may be uh, maybe uh, fall in that group and how we can uh, be able to identify these uh, these data types is it is it yes a yes of course where it concerns to privacy i mean of course the the, the work is clearly targeted to privacy protection so yes. it, not in general but but uh, to tackle the issue yeah exactly yes so yes in fact it is a very uh, it, it is a very important uh, 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 question because on the privacy context we need uh, as uh, also raised by claudia we have this uh, concern if the data if uh, for example the location or if the age uh, has been shared so here we are uh, what we have provided is these classes of audio video file and other but uh, we we also need to provide these other classes however in our approach as we decided to not to be intrusive what what and what we used was the encrypted uh, network traffic in order to understand about this uh, type of uh, network traffic that has been shared but including other application signals or including uh, other data uh, data that maybe come with uh, with the data that has been uh, uh, that come from the source may help us to also uh, be able to have a more finer grained <laughs> classification in, in this context uh, and and also this uh, re what we have uh, provided is we have pointed out in the future research work is the, the this requirement of being more finer grained in the classification and it is uh, an in, uh, in fact uh, an important uh, research line because currently uh, in the state of the art uh, we do not have this uh, uh, these um, works that they are for example using the, this uh, data to understand about what the type of personal data has been shared and and for the prevalence of such systems we, we need this data to, uh, this uh, finer grain classification Okay, thanks. I have an, another question uh, regarding what you were saying before. So when you characterize the behavior uh, and you check that uh, the application behaves uh, uh, in a way that is compliant to the expected behavior, do you also, uh, well, I have not seen it in, in the present work, but maybe I missed it, but do you envision to also define some kind of workflow because like the example you, you made before, uh, so that the application should first make a, a call to the encryption. So this suggests that somehow you might need to define a workflow to model this, this expected behavior. I don't know whether this was uh, already part of the research or envisioned uh, to, to basically to implement a more, uh, again, it's a finer grain somehow form of, of compliance checking because you specify a workflow, not just a, a single behavior. Or, or I don't know if this was already uh, included in your uh, behavior specification. So. Uh, yes. So, so here we uh, we use the, this behavior of sharing data as the proof of concept, and uh, the and. Uh, 
uh, we propose this this high level system model this model to in order to uh, define the the generic workflow for this process but we, we get into the details for this specific sharing data uh, uh, with third parties how to un how to check this behavior but on other behaviors to define uh, to define the workflow we did some preliminary study at the beginning of this uh, mod of this uh, proposed uh, proposed model in order to see how we can how this this idea is possible but at implementation level or providing the workflow our focus was on this specific uh, behavior which is sharing data with third parties Okay, thank you. I'm done with my questions. Thanks for answering. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Alessandra. Um, first round of questions, uh, and now we move to your two PhD uh, supervisors, and uh, that can provide uh, any comment, feedback on the PhD, and also raise questions if uh, needed. So we start with Daniel. Daniel, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mojde, for um, your presentation. And um, well, I actually have a question for you, but before I would like to spend a few words uh, on uh, your PhD. Because um, unfortunately, you worked, uh, uh, I mean, you, you know, you've been working on this Foguru project, uh, which required you to basically spend uh, uh, your time and divide it among uh, three sites. Uh, Upper, where you receive the training more related to innovation aspects and industrial applications of research. Uh, University of Rennes, where you work uh, closely with Guillaume on the more scientific aspects of uh, your PhD. And then uh, Valencia, where you spent uh, six months, if I recall correctly, uh, working on a living lab, so interacting with uh, stakeholders like uh, well um, public agencies local governments and citizens that are typically kind of you know outliers uh, in a phd uh, and this was already quite complicated from the very beginning when of course uh, well we happened to to, to to get this pandemic but nobody was uh, expecting but made it uh, really complicated so first of all uh, well, congratulations for uh, um, surviving and making it here because, you know, it, it is not uh, obvious. Having said that, uh, I think uh, your PhD work uh, uh, touches upon uh, a very, very important uh, aspect, uh, which is uh, security and privacy in fog slash edge computing uh, systems and applications. And I think uh, we are in a situation which is uh, similar to what... Uh, was uh, the IoT, the Internet of Scape landscape, uh, 10 years ago. And now I know that uh, I sound like an old man uh, talking about what they did when they were young. But uh, just to bring uh, some context here, 10 years ago, IoT was uh, really kind of a buzzword. Some companies were trying to push. There was a hype. Uh, uh, there wasn't really then, much about uh, technology. These kind of examples people were popping up with uh, was the smart fridge, which of course made uh, was really kind of a nonsense. Uh, but uh, 10 years ago, I started writing an article on IoT in which uh, our key central thesis was uh, uh, IoT is not about hardware, it's not about platform. IoT is all about data. And when it comes to data, security is uh, the key problem. And at the time, uh, there were not many like-minded people in the IoT sphere because everybody was thinking about hardware and how to build the electronics and power consumption, which, of course, are all important aspects, right? Uh, but so we, we, our claim was, no, IoT is all about data. Now, 10 years later, this article has more than uh, 4,000 citations. So... I can say it had quite an impact on the research community. And I think right now, for computing is more or less at the stage where uh, IoT was uh, 10 years ago. Uh, there are buzzwords, uh, there are people uh, uh, using it for, well, for marketing, frankly speaking. Uh, there is a bit of research, uh, there is not a clear research uh, agenda in the field. Uh, 
uh, people uh, use uh, the term fog computing, uh, edge computing, which by the way are different things, uh, to mean different aspects. Uh, but I really think in a few years from now, people will realize, but also in fog computing, data is uh, the core enabler, is the core value of fog computing applications and platform. And security, it's really the first class citizens in this context. So looking uh, forward, because you know that, uh, well, research is about uh, uh, building upon other people's work or standing on the shoulders of the giants, as the Americans like to say. So who do you think is going to benefit in the mid-term of uh, your research results? And how are other people in research, in industry, or other classes of stakeholders going to leverage your uh, research to bring uh, technology, society, economy, and of course, science forward? Yes. Uh, so thank you for the uh, description about the work uh, that I have done under your supervision and uh, Guillaume's uh, supervision. Uh, so uh, on the question that who will uh, make use of this uh, research, I think uh, currently the, uh, the uh, the data commission of data commission pro, uh, data protection commission of each European country that they are in fact uh, are using are protecting the data of uh, the uh, the use the citizens in Europe and they are trying to understand if the the application providers are uh, working. Uh, and, and providing the applications in a privacy compliance manner. Uh, how, in fact, I think one of the, the main sectors that may benefit from the, this research line would be those entities in each uh, country and also companies that they provide uh, solutions for uh, for example, in order to check the privacy compliance for the applications uh, on behalf of the data protection commissions, they may also use uh, the findings in this research line of the study, which is at the very at the uh, first steps. Uh, we are at the very first step of this uh, research uh, domain, and uh, the question on how they are going to, to use this, uh, this type of research, I, I think uh, we, in fact, we need to have some tools in order to automate this privacy compliance checking because privacy is a very important topic, at least in, in Europe in the recent years after 2018 when GDPR came and there are a lot of fines that, uh, for example, just one quarter of this year, uh, just the, the third quarter of uh, 2021, we have 1.1 billion euros of fines for these companies that they break, they violate the privacy. Therefore, I think the willingness would be in both sides, both the application providers, because they, they may not intentionally want to to violate the privacy but they may because because privacy uh, because gdpr may be not so much uh, understandable for the application developers in a company they are more technical so in fact having such automated tools to to make them a, uh, to enable them in order to know about this privacy uh, issues that they may have uh, would be also useful for both application providers and also those uh, uh, data protection commissions and even the end user can uh, can uh, profit from this uh, this uh, automated uh, techniques but in order to reach to uh, for example when we uh, identify uh, I can uh, speculate that for example, we have a full system that is running and it uh, reports a privacy violation, but we have some evidence like uh, that we have uh, that we have the application signal and these evidence are stored. So 
in, in those terms that we are uh, that the situation gets uh, serious because because the application provider is suspicious to violate the privacy uh, of the user, these uh, these techniques can be even more intrusive this time, not uh, necessarily unintrusive as we uh, do at the first uh, level of scanning all the running applications in the in this environment. Thanks, Marta. What about your first contribution? Uh, the first contribution, which uh, which was about a methodology for assessing future FOC systems, uh, here we are. I think uh, as we have the uh, we ha we will witness new for computing systems, uh, so there will be uh, designers and also the, the sec and they, uh, there will be security analysts for that. Uh, Fox systems. Therefore, uh, the, uh, besides the research uh, uh, community that they explore different aspects of a Fox computing system in order to identify possible future vulnerabilities, uh, beside this uh, uh, research community, uh, uh, we can, uh, we may, uh, this research would be, uh, we hope uh, it would be useful for security analysts, for system designers, in order to uh, reach to a more uh, secure FOX system. OK, thanks, Pasha. I'm done uh, with my questions. Thank you. OK, thank you, Daniel. OK, you. Oh, you. Sorry, Come on. sorry. One Guillaume who does not recognize another. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> so uh, thanks a lot, uh, Monday, for the very good uh, presentation and answers. Uh, I do not have any questions to ask, uh, but I wanted to comment on two points. Uh, despite the fact that uh, Daniel took uh, he stole the best ones uh, of me. Um, the first one is. Uh, it's about you, it's about your personality. So you, you look like this nice and uh, friendly and soft person. And of course you are all that. But uh, something that is not obviously visible is how strong-willed you are. Uh, well, just well, first to convince us that we should hire you coming from a weird remote country and in what? convincing us that you were uh, the best candidate. But I also, during the defense, I reopened the original PG topic that we submitted uh, in the beginning. And then I realized that what you're presenting today has absolutely nothing to do with what we proposed in the beginning. And, uh, and what that means is you're the one who forced us to steer the topic towards uh, those contributions that you presented. And you're the one who managed to do something that never, nobody managed to do before, which is to make me work on security. <laughs> so uh, I, I think that says a lot about you. The other thing is, uh, it has been said, okay, well, uh, your thesis was uh, part of the Google project, and uh, this type of project involves a lot of uh, traveling. So you've uh, spent your time across three different cities in three different countries, in the middle of, of a pandemic, where uh, travel was in principle impossible. And, uh, it is also interesting to see that uh, the work you have done goes much beyond the two contributions you have shown here. It is not very frequent when we look at the list of obligations of a PhD candidate that the majority of them would not be the thesis. So uh, I just wanted to emphasize that yes, okay, you have done uh, those uh, nice uh, scientific contributions. You have also built a fog uh, 
together with some other uh, students, but you have made it, you have uh, deployed it, you have made uh, users access it uh, and use it for real. Um, you have uh, followed uh, trainings on a uh, gazillions of topics, uh, including uh, innovation and entrepreneurship. So even though all those things do not necessarily show in the thesis, they are here. And I really hope that you will keep them precious and that they will uh, enable you for a bright future. Right? So no matter what you're going to decide to do, uh, my hope and my uh, prediction is that you'll be very well armed in the future for whatever you want to do. Thank you. Okay, that's all for me. Thank you very much, Guillaume. Thank you. Okay, I have the hard work to finish this session of uh, question and answers. I, I would like also to start with a, a, a comment because I, I think that your PhD topic is highly challenging. It is not only something very up to date and something we have to address currently and for future systems and thought systems, but uh, highly challenging because if we look at your first contribution, it's a very broad scope to address. And it is really hard to in the same time, having this broad view and also to go deep in details and carefully address all of the points. And for your second contribution, it is, from my side, even more challenging because you'd like to detect something very hard to, to, to detect it from highlights because privacy violations may be very, some small data like age, name, location that can go through a channel where they should not go. And you adopt a point of view in which the purpose is to hide everything, to bring protection of communications and to hide most <coughs> of what happens within applications. And so you have such a distance between what you'd like to observe and where you are, you know, with a networking perspective, which makes the things really challenging. And this is yes, a very another comment on the, the topic you, you address and the choice you make. Um, I do have only two last questions. Okay, uh, many questions have already been raised by the colleagues, but two remaining. Um, for the detection of traffic, you got a performance of 86 persons for non-applications and 84 persons for non-applications. That's it. Yes. Okay. How do you interpret such a performance? Is it a good score, a bad score? Do you think that given this detection accuracy, you could raise alarms and engage countermeasures, or is it insufficient? How do you see that? Uh, yes, in fact, uh, on when we wanted to identify the type of the traffic, uh, when uh, randomly trained uh, our classifier with all the application, we, we reached to 86%. And when we only trained our classifier with samples of sub subset of the application, we reached to 84% of F1 score. Uh, here, uh, in fact, we are uh, in ideal situation. We could be like reach to one as F1 score, uh, but or here- even 99. <laughs> yes. That's okay. Yes. Uh, but here we reach to, to this uh, percent for of the data. So here, in fact, uh, it, sh it will show some directions for uh, if we understand, for example, the type of the shared data is against what we ha what has been claimed in the classifier. Uh, it can be used in order to, to form more detailed uh, detailed analysis that may even uh, apply, for example, more intrusive techniques uh, uh, to, to go uh, to even this time uh, access the code or even follow the flow of the data. So here, uh, at, I agree that we could, uh, if we had a more like 99%, we could be more sure about the, the type of the data. However, what this provides for us also provides some hints that this application may be doing something nasty and we need to, to check it with more details with the 
data that has been provided that has been captured earlier and stored uh, somewhere uh, in the in the in, in here for example for, for as an evidence okay but here you consider the case where um, you talk about false positive okay you're not really sure <laughs> perhaps an application did something but there is also the case of false negative and all those traffic that you did not detect and that are actually carrying sensitive data yes and that case how do you see that Yes, in fact, uh, having false negative in the in the machine learning in the classifications based on machine learning is a limitation that we may have in in all the classification problems, and here, in fact, uh, the the idea uh, of at, of using such method that is not giving us 100% uh, assurance about if we are not forgetting about false negatives, for example, is that at least we have some view about those applications that uh, if we didn't have this uh, sec uh, this monitoring system, we could even, uh, uh, even skip all of them. But having 86%, I think it will uh, it will at least give us some skip, uh, put some light on those applications that are uh, sharing data and with, uh, against their privacy policy. Okay, and um, a similar question on performance. Um, this is the last question. You mentioned at the beginning that uh, cloud computing is a very good opportunity to reduce the latency over the internet, and we have currently very constrained applications. You mentioned some of them with latency uh, that cannot exceed uh, 20 milliseconds, yes. And we could also have some applications that cannot go over 5 milliseconds, for instance, you know, for, for instance, happy internet. Uh, how do you see um, the, the way we could enforce privacy and have a systematic check of traffic on the latency? Should, should it has, will it have an impact or is it completely independent? How do you see that? Yes, in fact, uh, we also uh, here on the uh, we measured our for that specific case, we measured uh, the cost of the system. We noticed that when we have this, uh, for for example, when we for the training part, which is offline, which is not a problem, but we have, for example, the feature extraction, which which is happening online after capturing the network traffic, and then we have the classification. In total, in total, they have like 50 milliseconds. Uh, they need uh, 50 milliseconds, but the point is that this processing may not. This uh, monitoring may does not necessarily need to be 24/70 all the day, but we can have it from time to time to check the behavior of the applications randomly and the existence of such monitoring uh, in, in order to also meet that requirement that we have about uh, some specific use cases that, that they are latency sensitive. We can, uh, uh, for example, uh, have this checking from time to time in order to uh, also cover that requirement of the latency. Okay, okay. thank you very much. This was my last question. Um, thank you for your presentation and answering all the questions you get. Um, we will move now in uh, the different room. Yes, so uh, for the jury members, uh, you may disconnect from this session and we have another session for deliberation. And uh, the two videos will move to the next room, so give us a couple of minutes to reconnect uh, and we can have deliberation. Okay. And the rest, you can stay here waiting for us. Okay, thank you.
That's okay? Yes. Okay, so, Mojden Faradi, you provided a very clear and pedagogical presentation of the scientific contribution and um, the position of such contribution as compared to the state of the art. The jury noticed the timely relevance of the topic to integrate security and especially privacy aspects at the early stage of cloud computing. Addressing such a topic is also very challenging due to the system wideness covering machine learning, fog, security, internet of things, etc. The first contribution standing for a comprehensive security analysis of fog architecture has been conducted by following an acknowledged methodology which makes it easily reviewable, while the second contribution has led to the publication of a data set, a public data set that could help the scientific community to build further advances in the field. This overall work appears to the jury as a first step in the automatic enforcement of privacy in fog environments, which motivates the need to go subsequently in more details for each of the fields that you have highlighted. For all these reasons, the jury decided to you to deliver the doctorate degree in computer science of the University of Rennes. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. A few words. Yes. Feel free. Uh, thank you for uh, for this uh, report that you provided to me. I would like to to first uh, thank you, the jury members. Uh, thank you, the reporters of the thesis, uh, Pierre and Kevin, and also the jury members, uh, Alessandra and uh, Claudia. And I also. Uh, like to uh, thank my supervisors in alphabetic order, Daniela, Daniela Murandi. Uh, I it was uh, it was my pleasure to work under your supervision for these past three years, and uh, uh, and thank you for sharing your insights and experience in industry uh, with me, and also your experience in the research. Uh, I learned a lot of new things from you and also thank you for having me in your company in Italy. It was uh, a very enriching experience for me. And Guillaume, thank you for your, uh, for your precise uh, uh, explanation for, uh, for these uh, very precise reviews on my work, on the thesis. I really appreciate what the time and dedication you had provided uh, for me. And it was a great honor to work under your supervision. Um, I also like to, uh, I'm uh, sorry, I, I just remembered. I, I didn't <laughs> mention Very your easy. name. <laughs> no, no <worries. laughs> sorry. <laughs> Thank you for, for uh, coming here and also having this uh, uh, questions and uh, also providing this report. I would like to thank you to all the attendees to this session. Uh, thank you for your support. I would like to thank uh, the FOG group members of the project. It was a very interesting project and I had this chance to collaborate with you uh, in building uh, the FOG systems in the Living FOG project in Valencia and also the other experiences that uh, uh, were exchanged during these years. I also like to thank the INRIA, uh, our lab, the, the MIRIA team in INRIA. Uh, and also I would like to, to thank my family uh, for their support and uh, especially to my husband who is attending here for uh, being always there in, in this uh, journey of uh, the PhD. Uh, thank you all. So I think it's time to close the defense. So I will close the Google Meet. Thank you.
everyone, uh, all the dream members, uh, are, are really appreciate. Uh, so uh, thanks, and uh, well, I owe you one. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Congratulations. Bye. Bye. Congratulations. Bye. Bye. Congratulations. Bye. Bye. Congratulations. Bye.